say, God is my portion. Oh, look at this in, in, in Psalms. And David is getting excited about this thing. And really what he's doing, he's encouraging him in, in himself in the Lord. He says, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And his soul says back to him, but I don't want to praise the Lord. I just want to sit here and pout. I want to be like the prophet. I just want to go out there and hide in the cave. And, 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 and David is taking charge over his soul here. Did you know you have to take charge over your soul? Your soul will lead you to the graveyard. Your soul will lead, lead you into depression. Deep depression. And you've got to take authority over your soul. And you say, so, you wake up and you praise the Lord. You hear me, soul? Get with it. Amen. Because you all, you all live in a real comfort zone and you don't have to battle like I do. I mean, you're, you know, the flesh doesn't bother none of you guys. Demons don't even get close to you. Everything is handed to you. Money in the bank. Everybody just loving you and take care of you and you have no problems at all. But with me, I have to fight. And I have to say to my soul, wake up, soul. Praise the Lord and forget not all the benefits of God. You know, we're talking about taking charge over the devil. Folks, I'm telling you, you've got to take charge over your soul. Amen. And listen to what David, this is what David is doing. He says, listen, all my inner being, praise his holy name. He's given command to his inner being. It just wants to be passive, sit there, do nothing, pout, self-pity party. And David says, so, listen, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And David began to get his soul involved in this thing, and, and his soul began to get a little happy, and he began to say, you know, he forgives all my sins, and he heals all my diseases, and he's redeemed my life from the pit, and he's crowned me with love and compassion, and, and God has satisfied my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Now, folks, when you get my age, you're going to enjoy that verse of Scripture. And so David is... is commanding his soul to get with it and he's talking to God and he's telling his soul to not forget all the benefits of God and, 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 and he goes on and says the, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed well I sort of got a little sneaking feeling here that David was oppressed when he said that word and he goes on and says you know he made known his ways to Moses his deeds to the people of Israel and then he goes on and says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Amen. Oh, I love verse 9. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Oh, thank you, Lord, that your grace every day is new to me. Your, 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 your compassion is new. Notice what it says, Or does he repay us according to our iniquities? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love and mercy for those who fear him. As far as east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions for us. And so, fathers, when you find yourself in the pressure cooker, open these scriptures, write these scriptures down, meditate upon these scriptures, obey these scriptures, and watch yourself come out of that depression or that depression. Begin to shout the victory before you get into it. And he goes on and says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, and the wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembereth no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. Amen. You know, life here is so short. I, I remember when I was 20 years old, and somebody that was 50 years old was ancient to me. You know what I mean? Man, 50 years old. 
man, I'll, I'll never reach 50. That's so far down the road that I don't even have to worry about it. Folks, let me tell you something. It is quick. I mean, it's like that. Your life is but a vapor. And as you grow older, you begin to see things different than, than when you were younger. Someone says, I wonder why Pastor Bob preaches like that, because I'm older than you. <laughs> I have more experience in life. <laughs> I've seen it, <laughs> believe me, through experimental <laughs> uh, 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 anticipation in life. And you see things totally different. But men, I want to encourage you. Sometimes you feel like, you know, nobody appreciates me. Yes, God appreciates you and your family appreciates you even though at times they don't show it. I appreciate you. I appreciate the men of this fellowship. You are important. And remember, God loves you. Now, as you get older, you know, when you're younger, you're reaching for this and you're reaching for that. And a lot of those things are not wrong. But as you get older, those things don't give you as much pleasure as they once did. Amen. And it really gets down. It really gets down to you, between you and God. I'll be honest with you. It really, you really understand when the, when, the, when the man of God says, the Lord is my portion. Because, because even though the many things that we reach for, and like I said, many of those things are not evil or, or, or bad within themselves, they do not give us that satisfaction. And I see a lot of men that, you know, they, they come forth and they get they're excited about getting married and they have this new bride and they have kids and they're all excited about their kids and, and, and they get their car and their house and, and all of a sudden one day they're 50 years old and it's like, they look around at all those things, and that's exactly what they are, things. But they, just, they just don't give you what you thought they were going to give you. And now there you are, you still have this vacuum in your life. And someone says, you know, God can be your portion. And it's amazing the transfer that has to take place in our lives as we get older. And as that transfer, as we, be, as we begin to see that all the things that we reached, to because we thought, you know, and, 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 and it's in all of us, you know, to excel and to be the, the top executive or the top boss or the supervisor or to be this or to be that. And, and, and we need all of that in our society. And we need people and places of responsibility. And then and, 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 and you finally get there and is this all there is to it? <laughs> Now you're in a place that everybody's demanding something from you. And you've got to produce. Reminds me of the story of the millionaire that drove his Cadillac up on the side of this bridge. It was way out in the country. And he had reached that point. He had everything, money, had everything. But he didn't have anything. He was empty inside. Because he found out that things do not satisfy and give us what we really need inside. That satisfaction of even self-worth. And there he was in that vacuum stage and he got out of his Cadillac and went over to the side of the bridge and looked down. He looked down there and he saw a little old canoe. One man sitting down there with an old cane pole catching brim, bringing him in. The old man there looked down there and says, boy, that guy is blessed. Boy, if I could just be in his shoes. And the guy down there bringing in the brim looked up and saw that Cadillac and that guy with his suit. He said, man, it really must be nice. I'd love to be in that man's shoes. <laughs> Folks, let me tell you something. Cadillac ain't bad. 
old fishing boat ain't bad, but if you ain't got Jesus there, if he ain't your portion, it is, like Paul said, nothing but dunk. And, and, some, and, and men, we're in that position in our age of time that, that, that we've tried this and we've tried that and we've done this and we've done that and this and that and all. And, and, and uh, folks, let me tell you something. It is in a relationship with Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit and you can have nothing and be the richest person in the world you can be you can have everything and and if you know him and if you have that right relationship with him you you he's your portion he's life you see outside of him there is no life a man's life does not consist in the things that he has but it consists in a person and his name is Jesus Christ and even though many Christians have confessed Christ as their Lord they have not connected in to him by by his spirit, they do not know life yet. Oh, they're saved that they die to go to hell, but in the meantime, they're just existing. Void inside, empty inside. Well, if somebody is, I can just get old Robert to lay hands on, on me. If I can get slain in the spirit one more time, if I can get the power of God down on my bald head one more time, glory to God, everything will just be all right. No, it won't. You have to develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Period. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Folks, let me tell you something. You might not have nothing. But if you know him. You know, when Paul was speaking about, when he was speaking about knowing him and the power of his resurrection, here's what he was saying. Experimentally, I, have, I want to come into knowing him experimentally, not just a bunch of head knowledge, not just uh, another lesson or another a sermon. I want to know him experimentally, personally. I want to know him intimately in his power and in his resurrection. Experimentally, I must experience Christ. And until we do, we'll be void, void, void. <clears throat> Folks, I talk with preachers, and, and many of them, boy, when you look at their churches, you say, boy, that's a successful person. What is success? I want to ask you a question. What do you consider successful? I tell you who's successful, the man or woman, they might not have a dime in their pocket, but they know whom they have believed in. They know him personally, and they walk experimentally every day in his presence. They know him. Glory to God, I'll show you a successful person. And he might not own a car. He might not own a bicycle. He might not own a tricycle. He might not own a boat or a Cadillac. He might not own nothing, but he is rich because he knows, he knows him, Jesus Christ. God allows me to experience certain things in life. I think, God, why do you, why do you love me so much like this? You know, let me experience this. You know, I remember seriously one time I was sitting over in my swing, and a loneliness, a loneliness came over me. And I was sitting over there, and I was looking and enjoying the trees and the land and the house, and I was just joining everything, enjoying everything that God gave me. And it was like it was like God stripped me of everything, and I was void of everything, and I felt loneliness like I've never known before. I said, "Lord, what is this?" I started rebuking the devil, and God spoke to me, "Don't rebuke the devil. It ain't him. It's me." I want to show you what it is. You have all of this, and I'm removing my presence out of your life. And this is what, this is what you feel without me. Hey, God, no wonder. No wonder Moses says, I won't go without your glory. I won't go without your presence. No wonder David cried out, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because he had tapped into God. He knew God. He experienced God. He experienced the glory of God. And without him, there is nothing. You can have women, money, men. You can have everything. But without God, it is but dunk. And if I wasn't such an educated man and polite man, I'd use another word. But our duck will be settled for this, sir. I'll just use duck in this message. 
call this message Dunk. It'd be a good title. <laughs> and folks, it is so easy. I'm, let me say something. It is so easy. And I'm saying this to the men because I see the pressures and it's so easy to get sidetracked. Sidetracked in responsibilities, pressure, raising a family, and, and, and lose the touch of God and, and lose His presence and lose his, the, the sense of His glory and the sense of your direction of where you're going. I want you to turn to Habakkuk, if you will. Chapter 3. That's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Habakkuk was going through a, a, a tremendous uh, experience in his day. And the, the children of Israel, of course, had sinned, and God was allowing uh, the enemy to come in and to possess their land. And, and Habakkuk had to make a decision, because, because I really feel here that, that there was a certain amount of, of, of pride in Habakkuk. He was still identifying himself with Israel, and I'm an Israelite, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and he was almost falling out at odds with God here because he didn't think it was fair for, even though Israel had sinned, yet th th these pagans were sinners, worse sinners than Israel, and he didn't think that was fair, and he was questioning God, and oh, he was going through an awful storm, but, but he came to a conclusion. And if you look at verse, well, let's start with verse 16. He comes to a conclusion in his life which brings him through this crisis in his life. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. Now that was the Old Testament attitude. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But in verse 17... We see that he's coming into the realization that, that God is his life, his portion, his source. And he makes the decision, even though he's going through a hard, difficult time. His nation is going through a hard, difficult time. He's, he's not agreeing with God at all the way God is treating the nation of Israel. And yet he says, though the fig tree does not bud. Now, boy, this is powerful. And there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, I mean negative, 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 yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. I want to say something here, and, I, and, and this is prophetic, and you can let it go over your head. You can throw it in the bucket. You can do whatever you want. But I know this for a certainty, because God allows me to be first partakers of his word and what the people of God are going to experience in the days ahead to prepare me that I might be able to help them. Let me say this. And all of your difficulties, you're going to have to come down to the same conclusion. Though my marriage didn't work out, though I didn't get that job and that promotion that I thought I was going to get, though I didn't get out of debt like I thought I was, and that last relationship that I was in, I have to say it like it is, it stunk. <laughs> I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Now, folks, the devil can do nothing with you when you're in the midst of everything going wrong and you just simply make a decision. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Now, brother, let me tell you something. That will bring you through... And you'll come out on the other side a strong man of God. But if you sit down and you try to figure out everything that's happened to you, why this and why that? I don't understand this. I don't understand that. Let me tell you, folks, it's not understanding. It's faith in the living God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Get that stinking thinking out of your brain and start putting faith in the living God that is faithful to you. He'll never leave you. He'll never 
forsake you. He knows where you're at, and he's able to bring you through. Amen. And let's don't sneak up the place with bad attitudes, but let's begin to rejoice, and the devil will have a nervous breakdown. Glory to God, it's okay with me. It's okay with me. Now, I'm not a gloom preacher, and you know it. But, folks, we've, got, we've been through some things. But we're going to go through some things that's going to shake the foundation of the church. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shake the, the foundation of Christians. And God is so gracious to give us a little taste of learning to rejoice in some of the little pressures and difficulties that we find ourselves in because when we have to face Goliath, yes. we remember that when we, faced, when we faced the bear and we faced the lion, we learned to use the weapons of God. And brother, when we have to face the famines, when we have to face the earthquakes, when we have to face the hurricanes, when we have to face when you see the weather pattern all over the world, and some Christians are still like, well, you know, I'm in a safety zone. No, my dear child, I'm telling you, your boat's going to get rocked like it's never been rocked before, and we're going to find out if you're a man and woman of faith, or you're just some Sunday Christian, goes to church on Sunday, and live like the devil throughout the week. And you can write that down. You can write it down. And I'll guarantee you, it's coming. Because it's here. It's just hitting all over this nation. But yet in the midst of the storm, there's going to be a people, a remnant of people, that's going to rise up with praise in their heart and on their lips in the midst of the storm. They're going to praise God. And let me tell you what that's going to keep them from doing, having a nervous breakdown. Brother, I know what it is to try to hold this and hold that. Hold this over. You know what I mean? And I mean, you know, and, and you know, listen, I'm free from it all. I remember the night when this, this uh, it was on, on, on the, I like the way they really pump the fear into you now. How does it go on TV? It comes across your TV. Thunderstorms, let's say severe Severe warnings, uh, se severe thunderstorms. I mean, you know, I've lived through th thunderstorms for 65 years, you know what I mean? They've never been severe. They just, you know, lightning, I mean, you know, now they're severe, you know. Hold down the trailer, you know. Make sure everything's in. I mean, hail, hail is coming as big as golf balls and baseball bats and footballs. And I mean, and you're watching that thing and, 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 and it's coming this way and they, and they give you, it's, it's coming down from Georgetown and, it, and it's, you know, it's hitting right on the next. So it's coming into Mount Pleasant and Goose Creek is next and, and uh, hallelujah and glory to God and I said Susan let's go to bed we went to bed and said Jesus you're my portion if we wake up in heaven we're going to have breakfast with you hallelujah and if we don't if we live for it we're going to just get up and eat breakfast here and I want ham and eggs for breakfast I want toast and coffee but I'm not going to worry about it And I'm telling you the truth, children of God, there are more things coming to you than you can worry about. you got to turn it loose. Turn it loose. Turn it loose. Turn it loose. Say, turn it loose. Turn it loose. Turn it loose. Turn it loose. Because you see, if you don't, let me tell you something. You jump out of the, uh, the, the boat and you're in the water and you're trying to hold on to this 100,000 uh, pound piece of gold and, and you're trying to save the gold and you're going down. Uh, you say, Lord, save me. And the guy says, turn it loose. Uh, Lord, save me. He says, turn the gold loose. Lord, save me. If you turn the thing loose, you find it, ah, turn it loose, and you pop up. <laughs> turn it loose. Turn that husband loose. Turn that wife loose. Turn those kids loose. Turn them loose. Turn them loose. Loosen yourself from them. If they want to go down, let them go down. But you stay afloat in God. God is your portion. You got to get tough in this thing, saints. You got to get tough. Let me tell you, the power of God is going to move upon a people that have learned to stand in the midst of the storm. Yes. 
I remember one time, glory to God, this woman called me, and she must thought I was the horriblest preacher in the world, and said, my son is home, and, and, he, and he brings drugs into the house, and he tears the house up. What am I going to do? Call 911. Get the police popping down there and get that boy in jail where we can get him straightened out. Don't take none of that foolishness. We got to get tough. Turn it loose. My God, I've held on to my kids and grandkids, and they know, and then they know that. I turn them loose. See, honey, it, it's, I say it's like this. See, the decisions you make today, sugar, is going to affect your tomorrow. See, there's a consequence to every decision you make. Uh, do, you, do you understand that, sugar? But everybody else is doing it. Let's go over this again. See, the decisions you make today, darling, is going to affect your tomorrow. And every decision you make today, every decision, it has a consequence. See, this is a, a law. Everywhere you drop this book, it's called the law of gravity. You drop it here in Goose Creek and it's going to go up, right? No. How many would bet all the money in the world it go down? If you were a betting person, sure. That's a law. But everybody else is doing it. Try it. And it goes down every time when they do it, too. You in China? This book is going to go up or down? Every time. But everybody else is doing it. Yeah, you drop it, honey, you're going to go down. You cannot fight against gravity. You cannot fight against God's Word. And when I got that in my little BB brain, and now that I have the knowledge of it, I try to teach my kids and grandkids that. But, Daddy, everybody else is doing it. Yeah, but, honey, every time you drop that book, it's going to go down. Remember the decisions you make today. There's a consequence. There's a payday. Now, thank God, God can forgive us. And I'm saying that to this church. Let Christ be your portion. There's so many things you've got to turn loose. I know there's many wives that want to see husbands saved. We want to see our kids saved, our grandkids saved. But I tell you what, you've got to turn them loose. Loosen them. Turn them loose. Trust God. Let God be your portion. And say, God... I know that everything turns out for good to those that love the Lord and that are called according to your purpose. That's the hope that we have. Listen to this, and we're going to quit. I want to see this again. In verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to go on to the heights. Folks, we're going to the heights in the spirit realm. We are going to the heights in the spirit realm. Absolutely. We are going, I'm going to say it again, we are going to the heights in the spirit realm. Notice this, I'm going to read that again. I take this spiritually. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights, on to the heights, going to the high calling of God, because the Lord is my strength. Amen. Now, there's pressures on the fathers today, tremendous pressures. What is the answer? You've got to turn everything loose. And one other scripture, and we're going to quit. And this has been a scripture. It's found in First Peter. Because I know you want to get home to those nice dinners that have been prepared for you. First Peter, if you'll turn there, chapter 4, verse 19. If I didn't know this scripture, I don't think I'd be alive today. There's a lot of things that happened to me, happened to uh, people that I love that I don't understand. But this is what we've learned to do. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. 
What have you been doing? You've been doing good. There's things happening in your life you don't understand. You commit your soul to your faithful creator, and you continue to do good with the strength of God. And develop that relationship with him. And loosen everybody and everything. Because if you don't, how many of you know that what you hold to will drag you down? Isn't that something? What a principle. What a principle. Now, I don't know. You know, you say, well, Bob, what is the mechanics of releasing that thing from your spirit and from your mind and your heart? I don't know if I can teach you the mechanics of it. Other than I cry unto the Lord. <laughs> I just get over here and cry unto the Lord. And, and I say, God, help me to release that person to you. Or release my daughter. Or release that person to you. And, and all I know is the Holy Spirit gets in there and works. And, and cuts the cords of, of bondage. And, 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 and boom, I, all of a sudden I'm free. Yet the circumstance is the same. I want to say this and I'm going to quit. So many times we think, well, God will remove me out of that circumstance. And sometimes he'll do it. But many times, let me tell you this, many times he'll release us, give us a release in our heart from that circumstance, yet we'll be in the circumstance, but it does not affect us anymore. Now that's deliverance. That's deliverance. An hour ago you were bound by that circumstance. By an hour ago you were, you were bound by that stronghold. By an hour ago you were just all bound up with that thing. And somewhere as you, as you moved into prayer and moved into the throne of God, you were able to commit it to God. And when you came out on this side of the throne room, you were free. What's the mechanics to it? I don't know. Other than the Holy Spirit works in our hearts cuts the cords of bondage, releases us from it, and all I know is we stand up on our feet and say, I'm free. I'm free. God is able to do that. And you, and, and most of us here, have found the secret of that. Yes, the pressures are on, but remember, God is greater than every circumstance. Regardless of what we have to go through, we will go through it. But just remember, maintain a good attitude as you walk through the fire, as you walk through the water, let God be your portion. Let Him be your strength. Rejoice in the situation, even though you don't understand what has come upon you. And God, as you go to God, God will release you and cause you to stand in the midst of the storm. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.